So here we are, the end of the second Lean IT Summit in Paris, 2012. Many familiar faces this year. We all were getting to know each other last year. And I'd like to say that there have been a lot of new relationships that have formed in the last year. And I hope for more of that to come, because that's, after all, what we're here to do, is to learn and build relationships. So in the spirit of Lean, what I would like to do is conduct a reflection. Um, this is a just-in-time presentation. I handed this uh, final slide deck to Sandrine less than an hour ago, which gave her a few gray hairs at the end. Uh, but what I've tried to do is think back through everything we've heard. Um, unfortunately, none of us could see all of the tracks. So, but I've heard a lot from you of what, what has impressed you of what you've heard. And I'm trying to uh, encapsulate that in, uh, in the next 45 minutes. Um, first of all, who is this message for? I'm preaching to the choir right now. We're all here because we have drunk the Lean IT Kool-Aid. And it's up to us to reach out. But reach out to who? Reach out to our customers. Because they're why we're here. And it's important for all of us to reflect to ourselves and think, what did we learn? What did we learn that matters? And how do we take this back? And how do we share this with those who we need to interact with? And I'm so grateful. Um, that Marie Pia and her organization made the investment in the high quality of the uh, video capture of these events. There's a lot of work that goes into that so that we can uh, bring our folks together once we're back home and share what we've seen here and, and have dialogue about it. So I encourage you to do that. So I'd like to borrow a phrase from Dan and ask, so what? What, what does this really matter? Why are we here? And I'd like to take that in three steps. Why is it important? What is it really? And talk a little bit about some success factors. And I want to try as best I can to correlate these observations with what we've heard during the last two days. First of all, why is it important? Well, enterprise IT, as we know, is a lot of things. It's fast. It's out of control. Mobility is going crazy. There's a lot of disruption. Most of all, it's uncertain. How do you plan? How do you invest? How do you keep up, hopefully stay ahead? Well, we had an interesting conversation at breakfast, Charlie and Philippe and I. Charlie's in the business of scanning dollar bills, you know, currency. And uh, Charlie used to be the enterprise architect at Wells Fargo, so he knows a thing or two about money. And we said, well, yeah. what's that? <laughs> well, well, and so we asked ourselves, is there going to be a day when we can't tell the difference physically at the atomic level between a, 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 a real currency and not? Well, that was an interesting thing. And another interesting data point, in Kenya, there are more people right now that have cell phones than bank accounts. So their cell phones have become their bank accounts. Think about that. They have skipped two technology generations. Telephony in cellular technology, and now they're skipping a generation in the banking industry. What does this mean? Because I think we're all here. It has something to do with making money, to make sustainable businesses. So think about that. Where is this going? Project this forward five years. Nobody knows. That's uncertainty. Time Magazine did a survey just a few months ago and asked quite a few people about mobility. Now, if you're really interested in growth in developing markets, you should pay attention to this graph. Mobile technology has given me access to a larger group of potential customers. In China, they answered 85%. In India, 82 In Brazil, 73%. Do you want to do business in these countries? You'd better figure out what it means to connect with your customers through mobility if you're in certain sectors. Are we thinking about that? Are we really experimenting on it? Think about that. There's a lot of uncertainty. So. On the topic of uncertainty, I want to share with you a little Harry Potter kata. Okay, I'm going to guess that most of you have seen Harry Potter. Do you remember the last movie where they fly out of Gringotts on the back of a dragon and they jump off of the back of a dragon into the lake, they swim to the shore, and Harry says, I know where the last Horcrux is. Okay, It's in the school. We need to go back in the school. And Hermione, of course, thinks this is a bad idea. She says... We've got a plan. We've got to figure it out, which is what she's good at doing, right? Harry says, Every, when have any of our plans actually worked? We plan, we get there, and all hell breaks loose, which is the end of the movie, right? Do any of you feel like this is reminiscent of our daily experience in, in trying to plan our projects and then you know, finishing them according to plan? So that's Harry Potter kata. 
So no more implementations. We need to come to grips with uncertainty. There are degrees of uncertainty, but we need to recognize that uncertainty exists. This is something that we can all read kata among ourselves and agree on, but we need to talk to the people who are in charge of managing risk in our companies, the CFO and the CEO, and we need to have a new relationship with uncertainty if we're really going to drive innovation, okay? So I like to define IT not by what it is or who does it or where in the technical stack or the applications or whatever. I like to define it by its value, by its capabilities that it delivers. One, quality information and effective information systems to enable business processes. We just heard, for any of you that were there, a great presentation by Klaus just in the last session about an agile, lean approach to an SAP implementation. Um, and if any of you come and encounter companies that are in the SAP implementation process, you know there's a tremendous amount of disruption and a lot of value in that. But this is what most of us think when we think enterprise IT. There's another element to enterprise IT. Information gathering and analysis to manage process performance and develop a better vision of customer needs. Okay? Somebody asked the chief technology officer of Toyota last year, what technologies business should be looking at. He said big data, big data analysis. Why is that, do you suppose? Is there something we could learn about our customers from big data? Is there a virtual Gimba out there waiting to be explored? Um, well, we learned a little bit about what it's like to really connect with customers from Micah Ballet earlier today. And Dan uh, Jones recommended a book to me a few months ago, and I went out and read it, and I recommend it, uh, Management in 10 Words by Terry Leahy, the fellow who led the enormous transformation at Tesco. And if you think you know what it's like to get to know the customer, think again. Read this book. This is how to get to know the customer. Um, another interesting way to get to know the customer, though, is watching their behavior and their preferences through what they do online. An interesting story, this is true, about six months ago, a fellow went storming into a Target store. It's a big retail store in the United States. And he asked to see the manager, saw the manager, and he was furious. He slapped an envelope on the manager's desk and said, you sent my 16-year-old daughter maternity promotion. Okay, how dare you do that? A Couple days later, the same fellow comes back in the store, asks to see the manager. He says, I just spoke with my daughter. She's pregnant, how did you know? Seriously. True story. Well, how do they know? If they've collected literally billions of data points, perhaps anonymous, based upon loyalty cards, which, by the way, Tesco pioneered back in 1974. We've come a long way since then. We start to see patterns when a woman switches maybe from unscented to scented, or maybe starts buying a certain supplement. We see some trends, and we start to act on that. And apparently, it works fairly well. Maybe we little need to be a little more careful about data filtering and putting an age filter on some promotions. But there is a dark side to data analysis that people are concerned about privacy. I think we need to take very seriously the principle of respect for people and respect privacy. But at the same time, if what Michael Ballet said about watching behavior, I would agree that it helps just to go sit and watch your customer or spend a day in their shoes. But there are plenty of things we can learn from watching their behavior online, okay? The third definition of IT and value are the technology-enabled features and functions that add value to the products and services. Now, the IT people in product development don't consider themselves IT. They're product developers. They happen to work with software and hardware. But I lump them into IT because in some industries, like Amazon, what's the difference? What is the technology and what is the product? or financial services. A lot of times financial services, the technology is the product. So it blurs what is product development and what is IT. Um, but what we heard uh, today from Takashi um, in the enormous integration of sophisticated technology both within the products, 100 million lines of code in Alexis, and the significant technology that goes into the development of those products, um, any more, many products are simply a platform for software and for delivery of technology. And I expect to see more of that. And finally, a medium for information exchange, communication, and collaboration. Collaboration among the enterprise, its customers, and the larger marketplace. Huge. This is what happens when crowds 
meet with purpose enabled by collaborative technology. It's huge. It's transformed a whole region of the world. It will never be the same. I was on the Boston subway a few months ago and snapped this picture. Somebody released a little app on your iPhone. When you see somebody doing something they shouldn't be doing on the subway now, you can snap a picture, press a button, and there's somebody that will look into it. Maybe before when you got home you might have picked up a phone and told somebody, but probably not. And suddenly, what are little things like this, little, little things, free in this case, doing to help empower us to do something that matters to us and matters to others? Um, now, put this in perspective. Is there something you could give your customers for free in this vein that wouldn't necessarily make you money but would create goodwill? Um, maybe think that way, and maybe that gets you a little closer to the customers. Okay? So when at the closing of the Lean Enterprise Institute Transformation Summit in Florida last March, John Shook in his closing remarks made this comment, and I thought this was just profound. It's a social act. It doesn't necessarily involve technology, though. People in rooms talking, people walking around, Gemba, um, learning from each other. So learning is social. And if there's anything we can do with technology to help the learning journey, we should do that and try not to get technology in the way of the relationship, which is at the real core behind the learning experience. It's the why. It's the purpose behind it. Okay. So, with that, let's move to the next topic. We've discussed why it's important. Technology's moving so quickly. There are so many reasons we need to get ahead of it. Now, what is this thing we call Lean IT, really? Well, we've been talking about IT business alignment and customer focus for as long as there have been computers. Literally, as long as there have been computers. And it seems like we haven't figured this one out yet. So in the old definition of insanity, if the thing we keep trying doesn't work, maybe we ought to try something else. And I'm here to suggest that the one singular profound message that lean thinking brings that is new to this challenge, it is the relationship between business and IT. You heard it today from several speakers that IT and the business are one. Well, that's easy to say, but how do you do it? Remember, you can't change um, culture, unless you address the behavior. Culture is an outcome. Behavior is the way we create those outcomes. So how do we do this? How do we act in an aligned way? Well, first of all, every time I hear somebody say, let's align IT in the business, that presumes that IT is a thing in the first place, when we all know IT is not a thing. It is a community of communities. There are architects, there are BI and anal analyst specialists, there are uh, uh, business analysts and developers and testers and operations people and, uh, and the folks who govern it and manage the projects. And every one of those disciplines, they have degrees and certifications, they have their own conferences, and guess what? They're all competing for a limited budget. So in some cases they're cooperating, but we can certainly create conditions where they, they compete. So my contention is before we align IT with a business, we need to align and integrate IT with itself. And I think that's a lot. That's the inward facing aspect of what we're here to do, is to find out how we all work better together. Then we can reach out and say, OK, we've figured it out here now. Let's reach out and let's work with you. So we need to work together. And um, I was really happy that Alan Shalloway joins us. Hey, Alan, where are you? There you are. Um, Alan, I really respect as one of the leading thought leaders in the Agile community. And I've just been watching you the last couple of days to see when your eyes light up and say something's different here because Agile is so powerful and so important. Agile, Scrum, XP, it's a long lineage with as rich a lineage of 20 years or more as Lean. And there's so much Lean can learn from Agile and so much Agile can learn from Lean. But the message that I think is really important here is that Lean IT is not an instead of Agile. It's inclusive, but it is the overall enterprise. And that's one message that I hope we all have taken away uh, today, um, is, is that. So how do we make this integration work? How do we actually act as Pierre from Toyota said, as if business and IT are one, which they are. Well, 
It's the value stream. Back to the five principles again. They really are timeless. And I see so many organizations put effort into value, into flow, into pull, and continuous improvement. But many companies never struggle through the very difficult discussion about what value streams really are. And if we don't answer that question, we may have various elements of the organization, including shared services such as finance, HR, and IT, at odds with each other. So we really need to focus on that. So what does it like, look like? I ask you to read this. So, in a way, this is kind of a cheap shot. Okay? It's just like saying, be like Toyota, or be like Amazon. And that's not the point here. It's not enough to know the behaviors of a Toyota or an Amazon. What we're really here to figure out is how do we, how do we practice those behaviors? How do we learn to be like this? Um, and to answer that, I really want to call attention to the last sentence. We still have a lot to learn, and I expect and hope we'll continue to have so much fun learning it. That is the spirit, right there. Learning and purpose. Um, and that is the motivator. So it's, I'm not encouraging you just to act like Amazon, act like Toyota, but the principles, the human principles, are what drive us all to that sense of perfection so that we can act together. So as we continue to define lean IT, it continues to move more and more in the direction of learning, collaboration, experimentation, improvement, and innovation. And I've heard some folks lately say, actually contend that the the step-by-step uh, -step, um, continuous improvement does not lead to innovation, does not drive in innovation. And I, I flat disagree. Because when you get a team that gets their hands around a process, owns a process, and starts improving it, and they start getting ideas in their head, and they talk to their customers, and they really appreciate the customer experience. That's where the real innovation comes from. Okay? And you have to start with that. So many companies put a lot of effort and investment into external innovation initiatives that occasionally will turn up a good idea. But I really believe it's the passion and the spirit and the purpose of the team that drive sustaining innovation, the kind of innovation that happens again and again, the kind of thing that you do see at Toyota, the kind of thing that you do see at an Amazon, for example. So that brings us to this. Um, this is the old equation we all talk about, the 80-20. How can we grow and innovate more if we spend 80% of our time and our energy on just keeping the lights on, keep maintaining stability? Well, the first step of this equation is operational excellence. A lot of things we do to do the standardized, repeatable things better, faster, and cheaper. And here's a list. And I suspect everyone in this room is doing some of these things. And they're good things to do, because these are engineering things. We need to drive as much uncertainty, as much variation, as much stability into these processes as we possibly can. Um, some of us try outsourcing, because we believe that somebody else can do it better for us. And um, if we do that with the sole purpose of reducing cost, I think we're in trouble. If we're doing it for the purpose of strategic partnering and sharing knowledge and growing and learning together, I think we're going down the right track. But we need to know why we're doing it before we do it, okay? But at the same time, we see, we all see, um, and we heard it from, I'm sorry, the BNP Paribas um, presentation, that there's a whole lot of things going on in a lot of IT organizations that pass for problem solving that are not real problem solving. And that's something I think the lean world, the lean journey can bring, is rigorous root cause problem solving. Because I think we all know when you really get to root causes, most of what we think are technology problems are people problems, are management problems, that are lateral to the IT, the IT operations and infrastructure organization. So while ITIL as a framework is a great playbook 
It's a great future state to move towards. The problems we need to move through in order to get there are people problems, communication problems, alignment problems, motivation and compensation problems, measurement problems. Okay? And the only way you get to those is by getting the people in the room, the right stakeholders, and asking why. Grab an A3 and let's go. So there's a lot that Lean can bring to the operational excellence. Once we're doing that and we are saving this money and releasing that capacity and freeing, liberating those ideas, that creative energy, then let's talk about growth and transformation, which is a development and innovation journey. It's a creative process. And these two are fundamentally different. And when I'm speaking to a lean audience that comes from the traditional lean manufacturing background. I think many of us miss this, that the success of Toyota, my understanding, is as much responsible for the success of the Toyota product development system as it is the Toyota production system. One is focused on operational excellence, the other is focused on development and innovation. And the two, not only individually, but the way they synchronize so well is what allows Toyota to bring out a Prius from conception to launch in less than two years. What an amazing thing, okay? And there's something we can learn from this, and that is that these two go together. But here's the thing. There's something fundamentally different about these two sides of the lean coin, okay? It's about certainty. Here, in the operational excellence side, we're trying to find things that can be standardized and made repeatable. On the development side, it's about leveraging uncertainty. If you talk to an agile person and you say, quality at the source, do it right the first time, they'll look at you and say, no, you've got to fail fast, early, and often. You've got to learn by your mistakes and then settle on that which works. So it really, there, there is a fundamental difference in perspective here that have to come together in order for this whole thing to work. And this is how I like to show it. There's creative, the development, dealing with uncertainty. We want the variation. We want the uncertainty. That's where the ideas come from. And there's emergent learning. And on the productive side, we're looking for standardization. Variation is an enemy. Although, whenever variation appears, that's a trigger that something's changed in the environment. We need to go ask why and figure it out. So variation is our friend at the same time. And we're looking at efficiency. Now, certainly, there is learning in the productive sit, uh, processes, and there's certainly process in the creative process. So the two are sort of the yin and the yang. They're two sides of the same coin. And this is why it's so important, the, uh, the uh, significance, the importance of the DevOps. We've had several discussions in this conference about DevOps, because what we're trying to do is mesh two things that are of different nature into one and synchronize. And that's the nature of the yin-yang, the balance. Um, the two need to come together. How do they come together? By working together, by learning together. It's as simple as that. But they are of different natures. And two things that are of different natures generally do not come together unless something is a catalyst to bring them together. And that's what Lean is about. And this is the, what, the, what the DevOps community is, is also learning. So what's the goal? What's the end state that we're looking for? We need to run our businesses. We need to do those things that are repeatable through operational excellence and continuous improvement and incremental change. Uncertainty is low, but there is always uncertainty. There's always change. And that funds our ability to grow, to commercialize, to open new customers, new products, new markets, sustaining innovation, step change, where uncertainty is moderate. Okay? And that funds innovation, where we do the imaginative things, the things that have never been done before, that are disruptive, that are radical. And often, the most successful, disruptive, innovative companies are disrupting their own market share. Think of Intel, Microsoft, um, other companies like that that make it a plan to sunset their own products before their life cycles have played out. And, and here, uncertainty is necessarily high. Now, here's the challenge. If you have the same mindset to funding and measurement and governance on all three of these, something's not going to work. There has to be a different approach, a different mindset. And here's the thing. All three of these things have to work together. Because it's not enough to be an innovative company that develops a new, great product idea if you can't bring that 
to market effectively and quickly, somebody else is going to cut from beneath you. So again, there's a yin-yang balance here. We need to be operationally excellent so that we can fund innovation so that when we release new innovative products, we have the operational capability to deliver to them to the market and take the profits to be the, the first on the market. Or if somebody else trips up to be the fast follower that, that picks the, the profit out of the market before the others arrive. So these two, the truly successful companies you see, are doing both of these at once. This is a balance, okay? So operational excellence and disrupt and development have to be together. And I think the lean message, because we learned this lesson decades ago in the manufacturing world, how product development, manufacturing, engineering, production, delivery, distribution, customer service could work together as a single flow and a value chain, okay? So, and I think we're learning that right now. I think that's one thing that the Agile community is learning from the Lean community. There's a lot the Lean community can learn from the Agile community as well. We are one. So, just a quick list of a number of things I've heard mentioned the last two days. So that those people who may be most familiar with Agile are saying, well, I've seen and heard some things here today that aren't quite familiar to me. The whole problem solving and root cause analysis, the A3, as a, as, a, as, a, as a guide to discipline problem solving and coaching to help develop problem solving capability. One without the other isn't of much use. Visual management, great to have a conversation today about Obeya. Um, I vow never to use the term war room again. First of all, I dislike the term. And second of all, a war room is usually a bunch of people in a room splashing visuals up on the wall, helter skelter. Obeya in any situation, is a structured visual presentation of a PDCA cycle in a visual room where a team is co-located, and they work and they learn together. That's OBEA. It's a learning cycle. It's more than just a war room, okay? Workflow management. One thing we haven't heard much here today uh, is on Kanban. There's a whole Kanban movement out there. It's not the manufacturing Kanban. It's similar, but there's a lot that's happening in Kanban. Um, to help us see what our flow is, what our demand is, where our, where our obstacles are, identify our, our, our velocity, and simply help teams visualize where the problems are. Okay? Visualization is key. Service management. I can't emphasize this enough. Problem management is a good framework, but it needs to be supported by disciplined problem solving, or else it will be ineffective because it is the discipline, pro problem prioritization, and solving practice that stabilizes the environment that lets us turn from reactive to proactive behavior. Okay? The rapid learning cycles, Kata, PDCA, Agile, Scrum, call it what you will, they're all the same thing. They're all the same principle of iterative learning. It's the scientific journey. Alignment, very powerful. Um, the, the story we heard um, both from Cesar at CINT and from Pierre at Toyota. Um, it's not enough to continuously improve. You have to continuously improve the right things that deliver the most competitive advantage. That's the real breakthrough. And it takes many companies years to get there. And then finally, it all comes together with the end-to-end -end value stream organization of business and IT teams, working and learning together towards a shared purpose. This is the thing that, from truly end-to-end, -end, that connects with the end customer that I think uh, is the real lean, lean journey. And it's very hard. It takes a lot of work. So finally, the third step and the last step. What are the success factors? I almost thought about calling this the seven success factors. And then I came up with an eighth one. So I almost called it the eight success factors. And then I thought, the moment I put a number on this, it's like these are the eight success factors. And that's silly. These are the ones that are on my mind right now, that are supported by what, by what I've heard here in the last two days. And so let's have some fun with these. Thanks to Dan Jones, who, who helped us right up front remember we don't focus on cost reduction. And isn't that what everybody has focused on in the last four years? And I like to say, I can guarantee you can lose a pound of weight. I absolutely guarantee. I'll bet you any amount of money. If you want to lose a pound, you give a pound of blood. Guaranteed. It works every time. The problem is you, it's not sustainable. You can't lose 10 pounds, and you can't do it over and over again.
Okay, but losing weight, cutting costs by giving blood in IT is very simple. Fire people, cut projects, reduce the service levels. Okay, fine. There you go, bottom line. Now, are we healthy? Are we bouncing back? Are our people now overburdened? Are we, do we have the time to focus on continuous improvement? No, of course not. So by focusing on waste, by helping people learn how to see waste and improve their condition, we can improve. And oh, by the way, capacity is liberated, quality improves, we get a better relationship with our customer, and in the end, as an outcome, cost is reduced. Okay? So it's important, like Dan said, the sequence, the sequence. Oh, and reducing cost by waste reduction naturally takes longer. Be honest about overburden. Eliminate Miri. I heard this from Martin and Matej of Tito, and I heard this from Alan, both, that you need to give people slack, time, because one of the principal ways that a company like Toyota continuously improves over time and drives defects down and drives stability up is every time they encounter a problem they are not only given the time, but they are required to stop the line and not only fix whatever's wrong, but say, why did it go wrong and what can we do to prevent it again? And only by doing that can you improve over time so that you have fewer interruptions, fewer line stops. But you need, how, at whatever capacity means to you, and however you plan that capacity, you need to build slack into your capacity equation so that people aren't sitting there making a decision between do I stop the line and fix it and get in trouble because I don't meet my daily performance goals or do I focus on quality? And if they have to even stop for a moment and think about which way to go, you have a problem on your hands. Okay. Now here's the thing. At the end of the day, if you've planned slack for the day, that doesn't mean you've wasted that time. At the end of the day, I guarantee that time will be used constructively in some way. Okay either to solve the problems that arise during the day, to launch a spontaneous problem-solving event if they do come to the end of the day and they have a little slack time, but the one thing they shouldn't do is overproduce, okay? So, but if you don't build that in, if you don't, um, if you, if you don't stop thinking that resource utilization, everybody being busy all day long is a measure of success, then you're, you're on the wrong road but it's a very hard habit to break. It's a hard mental model to break, okay? Third, develop people through continuous coaching and learning. Anybody who's been around Lean for years has seen this again and again and again. This little, this little hokey sketch John Shook's been carrying around since he went to work at Toyota, I don't know how many years ago. And it's a leader who's higher up the mountain, they've worked to get there, they've learned, and now their, their effort is into helping others up, okay? The role of leadership is to, is to build other leaders, okay? And we heard that from Dan. We heard that strongly from Pierre. And if I had to pick one, I would say this is the fundamental message because it is about learning and it is about coaching and helping people learn. This too takes time. You would need to factor this in because it is part of the continuous improvement process, not of the proce process, but of the people. It's the develop people before you develop cars, develop people before you develop software. This takes a deliberate and intentional and sustained investment in time, and it needs to be factored into your, whatever goes on in your mind when you hear the word capacity, you need to be thinking of this, because it will not happen on its own. It will be squeezed out by more urgent things, but not more important things. Then there is the need to know your value streams and own them. We're back to the second principle from Lean Thinking, Dan Jones. These are fractal patterns. Thank you, Charlie. We saw a great example of Klaus today. Um, suddenly, Klaus, I don't know where you are. Well, um, when, when the slide, when Klaus put up the slide on his value streams, um, cameras came out, including Pierre. I noticed there was a real interest in what, what a, a real def definition of value streams looks like in a very simple way. And certainly there are layers and layers and layers of depth below that. Um, and, then, and then Charlie, we've 
this is how we met years ago, talking on this very subject. What are value streams? Well, if you cannot define value streams, you don't know who owns them, what does ownership mean? Well, we learned it's not, it's, it's accountability, it's influence, but it's not formal responsibility. And that's something that is uncommon in the mental model of the Western manager. But it's essential for orchestrating value streams. Remember the picture of the orchestra construct, uh, uh, conductor that uh, Michael Ballet shared with us? That's the role. He called it a chief engineer. Okay. <sighs> Keep it simple. Um, if this makes you feel at home, you know who you are. Um, I saw one of these just two days ago, and it looked much like this. Um, many CE, CIOs that I speak with, um, especially the larger companies, have two very deliberate strategic objectives. Uh, one is uh, application rationalization, um, reducing the number of applications they have in their portfolio, 20, 30, 40%. Um, because many companies have reached a tipping point. Their application, their integration, their data model is so fragile um, that they've reached a tipping point where they know they can't keep pushing it and they need to start backing up. But this is something, there are trade-offs, and this is not a decision IT can make alone. The IT organization who understands how this convoluted mess happened in the first place needs to help the business make prioritization decisions on what we back off. Which leads to the second priority I'm seeing more and more on CIO's list, which is targeted technical debt reduction. Reduce technical debt by 10%. Reduce technical debt by 15%. Let's not start by asking how do you measure technical debt. There's a good question. Like uh, Takashi said, you start with three True North goals. Later, you figure out how to measure quality. But first of all, you say, let's, re let's improve quality. Well, let's improve, let's reduce technical debt because it is eating away, it is caustic, okay? And the worst part about it is we don't know it's there. We've become accustomed to it. It is slowing us down. And so the question, if that's a true north objective, how do we measure it? And then by IT and the business working together in process improvement, we prevent something like this from ever happening again. We do our darndest because this wastes, this is waste. Uh, on all levels. So keep it simple. I like one of the principles that seems to get lost in the Agile Manifesto, which is when you talk to someone who truly gets the spirit of Agile, when they show up in the room, people say, oh, there's the software guy or lady. They're here to help us. They're here to solve our problems by writing more software. The Agile person will say, no, I'm here to prevent more software from being written. I'm here to help you simplify your process. And if, when you have done that to the fullest extent you can, and you know the process, then you can very specifically say, little technology intervention is needed, and we'll do it quickly. And you'll be using it within a week or two or a month. But, so it's the agile mentality <clears throat> to write less code rather than write more code faster, okay? And in a lot of agile teams, I think that idea has been lost. That notion has been forgotten. Make it visual. Visual needs to instruct behavior. It needs to inform you. If you're about to hit a wall, it would be nice to know you're about to hit a wall so you can do something about it. And um, I really, I, there's so much talk nowadays about Obeya, and it's, it's a wonderful that you came here today, Takashi, that I think a lot of people are just in the experimentation about Obeya right now. Obeya means so many different things to so many different people. As long as it means getting a PDCA cycle up on a wall so that people are engaged and are able to identify and solve problems, whatever they think Obeya is, that's fine with me. You might not agree with me on that, but it's make it, make it visual. Help the problems speak to us in a structured way, in a sustainable way. And that's one thing that I find so powerful about Kanban in software teams, in IT operations, in any office process, is the moment you grab a, the, the butcher paper and the sticky notes and you get a team of people together, I don't know, I don't care what they're doing. They may be lone 
processing team or a claims processing team in financial services, the moment they can put sticky notes up and visualize demand and work in process and problems and velocity, you have given them the ability to see where their problems are, and you have given them the gift of being able to help them solve their problems. Until then, it's just a jumble in their heads. And it's up to us to help them see through that jumble. And that's, in my opinion, the magic of Kanban, just as a general uh, visualization technique. Customer value. I love this quote. Um, think backward from customer value, not forward from IT capabilities. I don't know that there's anything more I could say about this, um, other than to read Terry Leahy's book. Um, if, un, until you really know what it's like to be a customer of yourself, all you have in your head is a hypothesis. You think you know what it's like to be a customer. You need to go experience that. And lastly, embrace uncertainty. What I have learned in the last couple of years is that the lean practitioners Agile, Scrum, Kanban, Kata, the Lean Startup, the principles of Obeya, the principles of Hoshin Connery, they all mean the same thing, in that somehow we come together with a purpose as a team, develop relationships and a way of solving problems together. And uh, call it what you will, um, but I see, what I see out there is a community forming. Um, and that's, I think, the real, the real mission that we're on, all of us. So with that, I want to thank Marie Pia and the Lean Institute France for all of your efforts, everything that you've put into this, and all of the speakers and all of you for being here. I would like you all to go away, reflect, um, share, educate, learn, um, show these videos to your friends, tweet, blog, do whatever you will, carry your pigeon. Um, and get the word out, and uh, hopefully we'll see you all here again next year. Thank you. Thank you.